All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm gonna call to order the Board of Supervisors meeting for September 10th, 2019. Uh, call to order and ask the clerk to call the roll. Good morning, Supervisor Leopold. Here. Here. Profit? Here. McPherson? Here. And Chair Coonerty? Yeah. Um, now is a moment of silence and the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, before we all stand, I'm gonna ask um, everyone to keep in mind uh, the families and the victims of the tragic boat fire off Santa Barbara, which uh, had a disproportionate impact on this community. And we lost uh, really fine people who were community volunteers, amazing students, uh, really wonderful longtime members of this community. Uh, so during the moment of silence, please, please keep them in your thoughts and then, uh, then, we'll, have a, then we'll say the Pledge of Allegiance. Are there any uh, late additions to the agenda or deletions from the consent or regular agendas? Yes, on the regular agenda item nine, there's additional material, uh, revised attachment A, replacement packet pages 144 and 145. And then on the consent agenda item 17, there's additional material, revised attachment B, packet page 320. And then item 26, uh, staff requests that this item be deleted. Great. Are there any board members who would like to remove any items uh, from the consent agenda and put them on the regular agenda? Okay, seeing none. Uh, we're now gonna move to uh, public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the public to speak to us about items that are uh, within the jurisdiction of the Board of Supervisors, but not on today's agenda. Also items that are uh, on uh, the consent agenda and items on the regular agenda if you're unable to stay uh, because you have to get to work or take care of kids or other reasons. Um, uh, this would be your opportunity to speak to those items as well. Uh, and um, please come forward. I'm gonna ask uh, Gail Pellerin and her family uh, are gonna come forward and make a brief presentation uh, about Suicide Awareness Month. My son decided to drive himself, so he's not quite here yet, but that's okay. Um, so good morning, and thank you, Chairperson Coonerty. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. My name is Gail Pellerin, and I'm the Santa Cruz County Clerk. But today I'm speaking as a member of our community on a topic that is profoundly personal to me and my children, Emily and Jacob. Speaking out about suicide is another step forward on our path to healing. I wanna thank Chairperson Coonerty for proclaiming September as Suicide Prevention and Awareness Month in Santa Cruz County. And I confess, I did not ask for this proclamation last year because suicide was not a topic I spent much time thinking about. But on November 19th, 2018, when my husband Tom, the father of our two children, died by suicide, my life changed forever. Suicide is not something we regularly talk about. It's certainly not something I talked about much before November 19th. So I'm sorry I'm late to this conversation. But now that it has tragically impacted my family, I am here. I'm here to give a voice and a face to the topic of suicide. I'm especially motivated to speak openly and publicly because there remains a stigma associated with suicide that has got to end. I'm not an expert on the subject, like our amazing colleague here, Eric, and his coworkers, along with many other outstanding local and national organizations who are on the front lines of a battle that many still refuse to discuss in public. Suicide and mental illness remain difficult topics about which to speak openly, but everyone should understand that throughout life's struggles, we all need the occasional reminder that we are all silently fighting our own battles. I no longer use the words committed suicide because it makes it sound like a crime, which it is not. Instead, I say died by suicide or took their own life. I also no longer believe it is a selfish or cowardice act. Suicide is possible when someone is in a very dark, painful, hopeless place and they lose their fear of death. 
I've learned a lot about suicide since that fateful day. And I was shocked to find out that suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the US and is the second leading cause of death for 15 to 34 year old Americans. In 2017, there were 129 suicides every day. One death by suicide every 11 minutes. I think we've been in this room about 11 minutes. In Santa Cruz County from 2014 to 2016, we averaged 45.7 suicides per year, a rate that is higher than the state and national averages. Suicide does not discriminate. It impacts all people of all ages, genders, race, ethnicity, incomes, and sexual orientations. But there are some disturbing trends. LGBTQ youth seriously contemplate suicide at nearly three times the rate of heterosexual youth. Suicide rates for girls ages 10 to 14 tripled from 1999 to 2014. In 2017, men died by suicide 3.54 times more often than women. White males accounted for 69.67% of suicide deaths in 2017. Firearms are the most common method of death by suicide, which is an important discussion that we need to have, but not right now. Depression is a leading cause of suicide. However, 80 to 90% of people who seek treatment for depression are treated successfully using therapy and or medication. So that tells me that we also need to talk about mental health a lot more and make sure that people have access to treatment. So what do I hope to achieve by being here today? I want us all to recognize that suicide is a public health crisis. I reached out to our CAO, Carlos Palacios, and asked if we can include suicide prevention training for our county employees. I urge schools to make sure parents have information about suicide prevention, and I encourage parents to talk to their children often about their mental health. I hope all of us, no matter what line of work we do, we all will take some time to talk to our coworkers, our students, our clients about suicide awareness and prevention. I would love to see our county suicide prevention hotline number of 1-877-663-5433. And you can remember it as 1-877-1LIFE. Be more visible in our community, maybe post it at public restrooms and on social media. I want to encourage everyone here in this room or listening in to take the time to ask about the well-being of your family, your friends, and neighbors over the next few days, and to genuinely convey your appreciation for their existence by any gesture you think appropriate. A simple phone call, a message, a handshake, or a hug can go a long way toward helping someone realize that suicide is not the answer. So on that note, I want to express my appreciation to each of you here today, our county board members, my county coworkers, and the members of the public who are here in attendance. Thank you for being here. I'm really glad you exist. Now, um, my daughter, Emily, would like to say a few words. And Jacob, are you here yet? Hey. Oh, good. OK, Jacob's here. <laughs> <clears throat> Hello, my name is Emily Chaffin, and I'm honored to be speaking before you all on World Suicide Awareness Day. On November 19, 2018, I woke up a seemingly average 20-year-old. Worried about the rapidly approaching future, the competitive job market, my GPA, and an upcoming ski trip I had planned with friends. I would use the word normal to define my life. Up until that point, I had the privilege of not knowing anything else. Today, the word normal is retired from my vocabulary. For better or for worse, I have learned that there is no such thing as normal. I think of my life in terms of before and after before my father died by suicide, and now, after. Don't get me wrong, I had my fair share of struggles, especially during my teens, and my life was far from perfect in this before image of my life. But that's the thing. We define ourselves in terms of relativity. We can scale pain based on our lives as a whole. And I can tell you the exact moment when my scale of relativity expanded dramatically. Everything following 9.06 a.m. on November 19th, 2018 is after. In the after stage of my father's death, I learned that life is fragile and life is temporary. We do not get to choose the pain that we endure. I have learned that life is too short to make every mistake, feel every pain, and make every discovery ourselves. So we must learn from one another. 
we must use those around us to base our scale of relativity. Suicide changes lives in every way, big or small. And fortunately, many people are blessed with the ignorance of the countless ways in which survivors of suicide experience PTSD. But that's the thing about grief. Oh, sorry, grieving my father is a part of my daily living. Like breathing, it's vital and habitual. And similarly to breathing, if I think too much about it, I forget how to do it. That's the thing about grief. It's always there, whether or not you can consciously tune into it. Now, when I talk about my dad, I speak in the past tense. The seemingly mundane plural word of parents has fallen from my daily vocabulary, and I have been left with the impactful hole in my heart, the one that leaves me feeling unprotected, wondering where 50% of my parental love has gone. Every memory becomes frozen. That person becomes sacred. I found it difficult to talk about suicide because I thought involving others' opinions would taint the legacy of my father. But I cannot change how my father died as much as I cannot change that he died. And I've learned that no one can change his memory. But the stigma around suicide, that can be changed. I will admit, being vulnerable and outward about my experience as a survivor of suicide has not been comfortable. I've had people react with a comment that was more harmful than it was helpful. Even though it was an attempt to support me, I have had comments like, it is going to be okay, and you are going to be fine. I found them to just be belittling to a loss as deep as mine. I often felt judged by those around me, as if my father's suicide was a reflection of the strength of my family, or me. And I've heard people make jokes, unaware that their humor was damaging to my well-being or those around me. More often, I've experienced people whose reaction was to simply ignore it, to treat me as if their mentioning of my father or sharing some sympathy would remind me that my dad has died. I don't know who knew needs to hear this, but people do not forget. You are not reminding them that their loved one died, you are reminding them that they lived and that you still care. There is no right way to console someone who has lost a loved one to suicide. But even saying I'm sorry, I do not know the right thing to say, but I love you and I'm here for you will be better than saying nothing at all. My best advice for how to support those who are grieving is simple. Say that you are going to be there and then be there. Tell them that you love them and then love them. Follow through, show up, have conversations, share memories, tell stories. Remember that grief is different for everyone. Sometimes grief looks like laughter and sometimes it looks like panic. In many cases, losing someone to suicide, grief looks like PTSD, self-doubt, and anxiety. And we need to be reminded that we do not need to feel guilty, ashamed, or embarrassed. Grief can be easy to detect and it can be perfectly disguised. Grief is not always physical, sometimes it is mental. Grief is inconsistent. People who have lost the same person can grieve in dramatically different ways. And there will be times when they need a distraction and times when they need a safe haven. Offer to make space for when they need to open up. Not all support is about giving advice. Sometimes it is just about listening, being there to give a hug or share a tear. Grief can be isolating, traumatic, and long-term. Just like there's no correct way to grieve, there's no universal way to support. So we need to speak up, we need to talk to one another, we need to regularize the topic of suicide, or else we create a society where the discussion is taboo and the awareness is minimized. Without talking openly, we shun the opportunity to educate ourselves, or even worse, we punish those who are suicidal or have been affected by suicide with feelings of embarrassment, shame, and fear. And we leave them alone in the silence, unable to ask for help. The first step to talking about suicide involves you. Similarly to how you do not need to break a bone to know that breaking a bone hurts, you do not need to experience suicide directly to be a supporter of suicide prevention. Too often, we only worry about what is impacting our own lives until the day when we are impacted. I think that suicide is more prevalent in our lives and our society than we are presently aware. Through open discussion, sharing statistics, spreading support, and encouraging awareness, we can bring light to a topic that many people, including people in your life, are hiding in the darkness. Over the last 295 days, I often wondered, why me? Why did I get this path? Why did I suffer this trauma? And why am I aching with this tragedy? I realized that the universe is not going to answer this question for me. And as much as I believe that everything happens for a reason, and life is full of beauty, and sometimes fate works out in ways we cannot yet see, I learned that if I wanted an answer to this question, I would have to make one. So here I am, today, before you all, answering my question, me because I'm going to be the face of suicide prevention, and I'm going to shine light into the darkness. Life is short, and I'm going to make a change. And we have some bracelets for you all that um, are about suicide prevention. Purple and teal are the national colors. So you can just give them to Okay. Thank you. So thank you, uh, Eric.
if I could just say a few words, I wanna thank Gail and her family today for sharing their experiences. I know this was very difficult for them, but it's so important to break the stigma around help seeking and the work that we're all trying to do around suicide prevention. Last June, your board passed our county's first suicide prevention plan, and we're now working on our implementation plan which we'll be carrying forward and bringing to the board within the next few months. And this plan is gonna be critical in terms of the specific interventions and work that we do throughout the community to prevent suicide. We now have a framework and we're looking for implementing that framework moving forward. And again, I wanna thank the board's support, for not only for the proclamation, but for building a system of services for our community that will help prevent this from happening in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I just wanna take a moment uh, to thank you for coming out today and your courage uh, to share your experience and uh, raise awareness around this issue. Uh, Santa, Cruz Santa Cruz has a higher suicide rate than many other counties. Um, so we have a lot of work to do here locally uh, in order to address this public health crisis and, um, and your voice speaking out today really makes a big difference. And so I wanna thank you. All right, uh, next, next speaker. Hi, my name is <clears throat> Tony Crane, uh, and I am here uh, again um, objecting to the second story program that was implemented in our neighborhood uh, almost exactly two years ago today. Nearly two years ago today, I provided you with credible evidence that fraud was committed in receiving the funds to open that um, the, to implement the program and that the public was lied to, as were you people, um, in implementing the program. The program was not legal um, and I've given all the evidence necessarily to, to prove that. Uh, the, the speech before this um, tells us that w we do need, we have an, a crisis here in mental health. All the policies implemented have to be based on trust and law. And in the case of our situation, there is no trust amongst the people of county mental health who were responsible for the misrepresentations made in order to get the money to implement this program that was not legal, never was. Um, and and encompass community services and the employees there that were dishonest with the public, dishonest with you, um, and have been to this day. So I provided all sorts of evidence to that fact. Um, I also filed a report with the sheriffs regarding these criminal activities. Uh, th they passed that on to the district attorney. Uh, the district attorney looked at the evidence and said he was not going to prosecute. I have since then requested a copy of that report that I filed. And yesterday I was informed that I would not be allowed to have a copy of that report. Um, that was brought to them by county council. Since that time, I've also brought allegations of obstruction of a legal process, which was in order for this program to actually be legal, it would have had to gone through a public hearing and uh, level five uh, review. And it never got there because misleading information was provided by an Encompass uh, Services uh, employee, the operator, as the email that I have says. And county council also provided misleading legal information regarding the legality of the program. Now, county council is responsible for determining what information I receive that is of public record. And I think that that should not be. They've been implement, implicated in the, this issue. They should recuse themselves and I should be able to receive the information that I need. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Brando Sancion. I live in uh, the second district, uh, Freedom, California. Um, today I'm here with uh, Santa Cruz Community Ventures. I'm the program coordinator there and um, our work at our nonprofit focuses on creating compassionate and equitable local economies that contribute to the well-being of our communities. And in 2018, um, Santa Cruz Community Ventures and UCSC Blum Center explored local Latina mothers experience with traditional and alternative um, financial services. Our study examined mothers experience uh, with financial providers and mapped the location of alternative and traditional financial services, showing the disproportionate concentration of predatory lenders in Watsonville compared to Santa Cruz. <clears throat> um, some key findings included um, mothers used alternative financial services to pay for necessities uh, such as rent, food, um, deal with emergencies, or to build credit. Um, alternative lenders were often perceived as easier to access than mainstream banks due to fewer requirements for legal documents and social security numbers. <clears throat> um, mothers without social security numbers reported difficulty opening a bank account or obtaining a bank loan, even if they had an ITIN um, or an individual taxpayer identification number. Um, another uh, fact is uh, Watsonville has over twice as many alternative lenders as the city of Santa Cruz. So for every three, uh, for every one traditional bank in Watsonville, there's three alternative lenders. And in Santa Cruz, it's a one to one ratio essentially. Um, and also, uh, we, what an uh, interesting thing we found out is that mothers have a working knowledge of budgeting and saving and share this knowledge amongst each other, but there was a big gap when it came to credit building or asset building. Um, if you would like to learn more about this study, visit our website at secvonline.org. Um, we'll also send out a, I believe we already mailed out some um, reports on this to the Board of Supervisors, but uh, one last thing. Um, we will be having an event on October 15th at the Civic uh, Community Plaza in Watsonville starting at 9 a.m. And uh, we hope that you guys can join us and we'll send out some invitations as well um, to, to have you guys there. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gary Richard Arnold, uh, just walking around the building here, we see posters that talk about <clears throat> accountability, collaboration, uh, trust, transparency. Uh, these are just slogans. Uh, they're wrong. I want to uh, congratulate Bruce McPherson. This is his 20th year anniversary for uh, forming an organization which included uh, members of Sam Farr's uh, staff and his staff. It included Dan Hefley, who brought in the ICLE, the World. Bank and United Nations program that the planning department has taken. And it's uh, great to appreciate the uh, uh, the chairman here, uh, Mr. Coonerty. Uh, he was graduated from the Fabian London Socialist School in which they are calling for regional government. They hate self-government. In fact, in their booklet uh, put out by them, it says each year that pass, the obsolete, inefficient character of local government organization is increasingly obvious. They mean self-government. They want to run by uh, people that were trained as, as administrators. They, it's imperative for a radical improvement in the structure of local government. Well, Mr. McPherson has done it. Uh, we now have uh, in California the whole state broken down into cities and counties where they transfer their authority. The one here is meeting tomorrow night, the directors over here in Corlitos. You'll see the traders that are not transparent and you can't trust them because community TV won't report it and where they pay for it. Keep smiling, Mr. Coonerty. Um, it includes Sam Farr. Sam Farr here is seen with his United Nations flag right next to his uh, congressional office. We also see Bruce McPherson right next to a lady here uh, Katrina Kuhn, triple Chinese, red Chinese communist agent. We got two plaques out here on the courthouse steps dedicated to communist Chinese espionage agent Hugh DeLacy. And you all keep that. Um, 
and uh, Mr. Caput, all of you, all of you people are outrageous. Uh, you have been sustained through the Trilateral Commission. Uh, Zygmunt Brzezinski said regionalization is keeping with the trilateral plan, which calls for gradual convergence of east and west, ultimately leading towards a goal of a one world government. In fact, Brzezinski, time after time, uh, boy, this is the quickest two minutes, uh, Goldwater said the Trilateral Commission is a vehicle for multinational consolidation and banking as to seizing the political government of the United States in a skillful, organized plan for monetary, ecclesiastical, and political combinations. And this is California Forward co-chairman, which is uh, Leon Panetta, espionage collaborator, and Lenny Mendenka, who called for the elimination of local governments, 80% of them through his Committee for uh, Development. Same with Willie Brown, the chairman of the Board of Super, or the chairman of the Assembly, called for the abolition of cities and counties and have everything run from Sacramento. And keep smirking. You're cheating these people. You're traitors to this country. Next speaker, please. Hi. <laughs> I'm Diana Nickel, and I'm here today to talk about the 5G network. Um, the National Toxicology Program concluded that there is clear evidence that male rats exposed to high levels of radio frequency radiation used in the 3G net cell phones developed cancerous heart tumors, according to the final report. This is a 10-year study. That's how long it took to take it. The levels of exposure were 1.6... Um, 1.6, let me get this right here, uh, watts per kilogram, which actually is the uh, permissible level that cell phones can expose us to when we're using our cell phones. That's the measurement that, that our, um, I believe it's the FDA uses or the FTC, I can't remember which. Um, so you might think, well, maybe 5G is safer. The problem with 5G is that, yes, it does penetrate less through the skin than the th uh, 3G penetrates approximately four inches into the body, two to, three to four. 5G will penetrate less into the body. The problem is, is that they, they put together and uh, several cells to, to uh, direct the energy and, they're, and they, they rotate them to focus the energy. And by doing that, it intensifies the energy. So it may not just penetrate an inch <laughs> with that type of focused array in these, these cell t uh, little mini cell towers are going up in front of people's homes, in front of businesses, all over the county. I see them on 7th, uh, is it Seabright Avenue now? And um, several places. And, you know, I wouldn't want to live in front of a home that has one of those. I, I'd be quite concerned, especially as they do start to create the focused array and, and direct the energy. And they're doing that because it has a less penetration through the building. So they have to direct the energy and focus it in order to penetrate the buildings. That's what 5G is. And it's not a myth, it's a fact. <laughs> and now we have the evidence from the National Toxicology Program after 10 years that yes, it does increase the cancer rate significantly. Uh, clear evidence, they state, NTP uses four categories to summarize the evidence that a substance may cause cancer. The clear evidence is the highest. That's what they found in the study. For female rats, it was equivocal, equivocal evidence, which is a little lower, but there was still some evidence. That's the facts as we know them today. So we need to get on this and not let this take over our communities and, and, and potentially risk the people at risk. There's just no reason to do that. You know, there's other ways we can communicate and, and safely, you know. Marilyn Garrett, part of uh, EMF Aware and Wireless Radiation Alert Network. Uh, I did call two of your offices yesterday to uh, encourage you to come across the street to a presentation 
uh, at the Resource Center for Nonviolence of Ali Johansson, who is a global authority on adverse health effects of modern artificial electromagnetic fields like cell towers, cell phones, et cetera. And one of his statements was, there is no safe amount of this radiation. What's natural is the background radiation that we evolved with. But we are now exposed to one quintillion times the radiation that is in the natural background radiation. That's one with 18 zeros, and these are pulse modulated frequencies. Now, as I was listening to the sad account of suicide and the figures on it, I thought of a friend of mine who had spoken here years ago, Karen Stern, who took her own life, and she was very active in opposing these cell towers and very affected by this microwave sickness, often called electrohypersensitivity. And she couldn't find a place where she felt good. Um, she was like being felt tortured. And the proliferation, of course, has increased of this assault of toxic radiation exposure. It's estimated uh, 2 million people around, no, I think it's 20 million are so harmed that they can't live in their own homes, they can't work, they're EMF refugees. And surveys around cell towers have shown people experiencing uh, sleeping disorders, depression tendencies, fatigue, um, heart palpitations, et cetera. And neurobehavioral problems. There's a relationship here that Dr. Klinghardt, you might look him up, Dr. Klinghardt also discussed of affecting our health in a myriad of ways, including, uh, you know, suicidal tendencies. And you think, what have we been exposed to over the last 20 years massively, like the figure I just gave you? This is huge, and it's very much related to what was discussed here. Uh, thank you. We need to remove this harm. Thank you. Good morning, board. My name is Robert Edward Holdridge. I come, to, I come here this morning to address a matter of public safety. <clears throat> I don't, intend to, I don't intend to incite anything. I'm just saying there's a bunch of smoke coming from a pile of glowing embers. I found this, this social media post. I want to thank my friend for contacting me this morning to help him clear his property of unwelcome guests. It's been many years since I've been able to carry my firearms in an open carry situation. But today with a down slung Bushmaster and a Glock on the waistband, nobody had any questions for me. Ran off like 20, 50 tweeters and only expelled 15 rounds. The rounds were expelled only as a deterrent. Man, those tweakers can run fast. Tomorrow morning, we return with the sheriff's department. Anyone up for a Father's Day tweaker hunt? I found that to be rather chilling. Do you find that to be chilling? Yes. Do you really? Here's a copy of it. I've got copies. You can contact. Sir, you sir. Contact your supervisor. Okay, sir, you're. Thank you. Are you. Are, Oh, oh, my time. That's, I just wanted to make a public, public safety. And okay, thank you. I found these. You want to have those? Maybe hand them out. Thank you. Frank, you're up. Board, uh, Brent Adams of the Warming Center Program. Um, I want to express just how grateful and honored I am to serve the community in the way that we do with the Warming Center program. It's a small nonprofit um, uh, that came into the uh, uh, 
the community from the protest uh, uh, activism. Uh, we learned quickly about the funding um, models and the HAP and the Homeless Services Center and lots of the things that's, that are going on. And we, we, we came into being because the Homeless uh, Services Center and the Armory had a population cap at, during a 10-day uh, cold snap of only 100 people, leaving so many people out. So we as a community came together and started the warming center. Now not one person has to sleep outside on the coldest nights. We just completed our fifth year. We're moving into our sixth year. Uh, I don't know a lot about government uh, going in. Now I know less about it. Uh, I, I'm, I'm actually frightened about government uh, as, as around homelessness and the larger sweeps, uh, the paradigms of homelessness. And, and, and if you work like I do on the street, you see that the money doesn't really trickle down and things get actually worse. But I want to celebrate with you when you celebrate with me that the warming center program with the storage program, I want you to really know about the storage program and why it's successful, the laundry program, the hotline, that's distinct from 211. And if you've never called 211 posing as a homeless person needing shelter tonight, then I encourage you to do that. It's an eye opening experience. What is the true experience of homelessness in the scope of the HAP, the county funding? Uh, we're positioning ourselves between the HAP funding and the whole movie of funding and protest or, or orientation for needs-oriented services. What are the basic unmet needs for all the meetings you've had and the millions spent? They're still huge unmet needs and they're easy to accomplish. In fact, right now, we've totally transformed the experience of homelessness and a lot of us didn't even really notice it. Storage program has almost 600 people who've worked with this in the last year. Laundry, free laundry for anybody who steps in the door now. Why wasn't that a thing? It turns out uh, one of the big unmet needs of homelessness is, is laundry. What does it communicate to a community that government county funds a shelter and most of the people can't even get into it on the coldest nights? What does it communicate? Uh, what does it communicate that we're not even talking about storage, uh, but we're talking about... All so what I'm speaking to you is five individuals. You work for the government, uh, but I would really like you to investigate and find out what the warming center and storage program is for yourself. Come and visit us, have a meeting with us. F hold us up to the light and find truly why we've transformed this experience. We're not talking about transitioning homelessness anymore. It's ridiculous. It's a, it's a, it's, I, I mean, I don't wanna uh, talk about the national uh, paradigm, but we're transforming the experience of homelessness for us all and it's completely uh, trans revolutionized lives. Thank you. Um, we're here for the Childhood Cancer Awareness Month proclamation. I'm going to ask for a little extra time. We could go last if you want. I've got three people here. Could we multiply our time? Well, um, we can't. We can't have people sort of trading time. Uh, if I can give you five minutes as part of a presentation, does that work? Yeah, that'd be fine. Okay, yeah. I just don't want uh, Sarah Moore to be cut off in the middle of her talk. Sure. So yeah. So I'm going to start and then bring her up. That makes oh. sense. Okay, yes, yes, sense? yes, yeah. we can make, we'll make it work. Okay, thank you, appreciate that. So it is September, um, that is um, the proclamation which we do every year here in this chamber to declare September, excuse me, Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. Yesterday, um, let me talk about 21 years ago. 21 years ago, I went into a hospital room where little Jacob, who was five years old, was just diagnosed with acute myelogenous leukemia, one of the most fast and furious types of pediatric cancer there is. From that day birthed the formation of Jacob's heart, which for the past 21 years has provided an array of supportive services for families who are enduring the unimaginable. And this is unique in this community and we've kept it local and we've kept it here to respond to the needs of our children. 21 years ago, I thought Jacob's heart was a temporary need. I truly believed that in maybe 10 years most, somebody would figure this out and find a cure and we would no longer need supportive services for children with cancer and their families. That hasn't been the case. The incidence of pediatric cancer is rising and it's rising in our community. Yesterday, I sat in another hospital room that actually looked very similar to the one 21 years ago to a, with a little girl 
who just was starting kindergarten. She lives right here in our local community with the same kind of cancer that Jacob had. It's a fast and furious, nasty cancer. She's lost all her hair. She's got her little princess wigs that she wears in the hospital. Darling little girl, ballet dancer. The treatment that she's receiving is pretty much the same as the treatment that Jacob received 21 years ago. I'm hoping that we'll be able to declare to you that she will survive like Jacob did survive. And unfortunately, in our community, we've lost so many children to cancer. And Jacob's heart has been there with love and support. One of the most nasty forms of childhood cancer is DIPG. It's, a, it's an aggressive brain tumor that it's called TAD, terminal at diagnosis. And last year, um, we read a letter from a mother Sarah Moore, I'm sure you all remember that um, Ishtar Carter, Sarah's friend, came and read that letter on behalf of Sarah. And Sarah's here with us today. A year ago today, she was in the process of just grieving the loss of her boy. And she wants to share with you, on behalf of Jacob's Heart and other families, the deep gratitude we have for your support. I know every year I go through the litany of all of you guys, each one of you has been so intimately involved in this. And I, I just can't think of a better community to live in. And I know you guys get blasted all over the place, but when it comes to pediatric cancer, this community cares and it's your leadership in making sure that families like Sarah's, and I wanna invite Sarah and Ishtar to come up to kind of reconnect with you. And I want you to meet the woman behind the letter and we'll read it again for those of you who were not um, here last year. Um, this is uh, Sarah Moore, Hi. mother of Charlie, and Ishtar Carter, her friend, who's gonna read it for her. Last year on September 18th, I stood before you all accepting an amazing proclamation that I thank each and every one of you for. Here's the letter. Good morning, my name is Sarah Moore. I am mourning my oldest son, Charlie. He died of diffuse midline glioma, a rare inoperable brain tumor on August 31st, 2018 at 11 years old. I am here speaking to you today, thanks to the immeasurable love of Jacob's heart and their selfless acts of compassion during the most traumatic year of our family's life. I received a phone call last September, two Septembers ago, from their founder, Lori Butterworth, the day after Charlie came home from a whirlwind week at the PICU at Stanford. I remember standing on the cliffs above Seabright when she reached out because she had heard our child was diagnosed with cancer and she wanted to tell us about their Kid Rage's Golden Carnival the next day in Watsonville. An honest chat and a simple invitation became one of the most meaningful relationships I've had in 40 years. Each individual at Jacob's Heart, from the board members who also work in the cancer ward, the volunteers who paint brown bags for the grocery deliveries we get on Thursdays, or the ladies who send thank you cards for those of us who can't find the energy has changed me for the better. We have laughed, cried, anguished, and celebrated together. The Jacob's Heart family has accompanied us to appointments at Lucille Packard's Children's Hospital and hosted and attended our kids' birthday parties, paid our bills for us, and gave us the priceless gift of time together at their annual family weekend camp heart and hands. When some of the most amazing pediatric neuro-oncologists in the county, in the world, tell you to create memories with your dying child, it makes all the difference in the world if you have the heartfelt friendship, experience, financial, emotional, and psychological support of a unique organization such as Jacob's Heart. In our dreams, they wouldn't exist. In our shattered reality, they are vital to the survival of kids, siblings, parents, grandparents, relatives, and friends who are literally doing their best to endure the unfathomable. We appreciate your public acknowledgement. They deserve every honor and accolade for 20 years of making the surreal details manageable, the hardest moments somehow happy, assuring us that despite the lack of national funding for pediatric cancer, someone cares. And thank you all for caring. Hey, good please. Quick update that I wrote. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I'm Sarah Moore. Charlie has my son, my oldest son. Excuse me. Sorry. I just went away. It's 
So today, I just have a little note. We are 375 days out from my oldest son, Charlie's death from a rare brain cancer, diffuse midline glioma. As many people as I can remember have told us it will get easier, but it doesn't. Every person's grief is unique, as you heard earlier. And for my husband, Kelly and I, our life gets harder each day. Because our love for Charlie is alive, it will be forever, as it is for his little brother Shane and his little sister Alice. This is why the awareness means so much and that we're so appreciative of your establishment of September as Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. Because we do keep breathing, and by God's grace, with the support of our community and Jacob's heart and their precious help, they deliver groceries, they send our kids mail, they provide a place for us to grieve comfortably together at carnivals, camps, and bereavement retreat that's coming up in a couple weeks. Our family is joyful, full of hope, and excited for the future when fewer kids will hopefully have to suffer senselessly, won't have to suffer senselessly as Charlie did, thanks to the awareness being raised here today. Thank you. I just want to acknowledge this, the bravery and the courage of Sarah coming back and that, that circle back. Um, and I just want to, want to say that I'm sure we all agree that no child should ever have cancer. That's a given. And I want to guarantee that until there's a cure, Jacob's heart will be here right here in our community. So I would like all of us to join. Do you mind if I turn and get, I know I'm not supposed to leave the podium. Yeah, right? it's okay. Yes, go ahead. Um, I would like to ask you all to stand as we declare September Childhood Cancer Awareness Month in the county of Santa Cruz. Yeah. Am I okay to do this? I, I know I'm not the, the... You're doing it. It's good. Doing it? We're good. Come on, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not running for office, I promise. But we will yeah. declare um, Childhood Cancer Awareness Month September Childhood Cancer Awareness Month in the County of Santa Cruz and honor our children. Thank you, Sarah. Let's give a round of applause. Thank you. So, thank you, Lori. Thanks to your whole team at Jacob's Heart. Thank you, Sarah, for coming and sharing your story with us today. Uh, heartbreaking, but the love that you um, are, are showing, demonstrating, and the kind of community that, that we've been able to pull together, um, it, it means a lot. And, and it's, I can't imagine your experience, but I appreciate you coming and talking today. Morning, Chair Coonerty, honorable members of the Board of Supervisors, Mimi Hall, Director of the Health Services Agency. Um, as is made obvious today, but also every day, we have a lot of important work as um, the county department that is overseeing so much of our county's health and well-being. So today, I'm very pleased and honored to introduce to you Marcus Pimentel, our Health Services Agency new Assistant Director. And he comes to us with um, a great deal of demonstrated experience and passion and ability, both as a finance officer and also as a community member and a contributor to health and wellness in Santa Cruz County. I'll let Marcus say a few words. So I'm a little overwhelmed from the previous speakers. Um, what I was gonna talk about a little bit of why I'm here and why I made a career shift into healthcare. And it dates back to my parents' values. It's an opportunity to align the values that they instilled in me. They were Portuguese immigrants. They came here. They were saddled with debt by coming here. And as a child, I unknowingly gave them more debt with some healthcare issues a couple of times when I was little. And it was only decades later that they told me about those struggles. And they never talked to me about that. They never gave us the impression that they were struggling. We, we saw a life of, of happiness and joy. And yet while they were working days and nights and they were still serving the community, they were serving in three or four different ways. They were dragging us off on weekends. And we were, I thought it was child labor when I was a young child, but I came to reflect on the service that they were doing. Those same values is what has driven me to plant my seed in Watsonville, stay in Watsonville and work within a very short radius of that. I love this community. I'm honored to serve it and I've often overserved but I, I'm grateful for all those opportunities and I'm really humbled by this opportunity to work here at the county to align my personal, per, personal and professional passion, skills and motivations in both healthcare and administration and to bring that community lens of equity and, and community service. I'm very honored to be here and be here tonight. And again, I'm kind of humbled by the prior, prior speakers today. Marcus, we're, glad, we're really glad to have you. We look forward to working with you. Good 
Good morning, Becky Steinbrunner, resident of rural Aptos. Um, there've been a lot of moving things here this morning and I really don't want what Mr. Crane, Tony Crane has told you here this morning and has repeatedly brought to you get lost. Please listen to him and please address this miscarriage of justice that he repeatedly brings before you. This is wrong and you as our elected leaders need to address it and make it right. September is also National Preparedness Month. And I know that your board was supposed to be reviewing the possibility of a new uh, rural resident fire tax this morning and it's been postponed. I'm not sure why. But I want to again drive home to you that this county has $18 million through the state half cent public safety sales tax that rolls into this county every year. And zero of that is going to fund fire protection in the rural areas. $18 million and zero goes to county fire. Zero of the proposition of the measure G half cent countywide sales tax that your board and Mr. Palacio put before the voters and sold to um, ensure that fire protection and other emergency response would be funded, zero of Measure G is going to fund county fire. I think this is a real, again, miscarriage of justice. And it is uh, turning your backs, in essence, on your rural constituents, turning your back on the rural environments, the beautiful environments that bring tourists here. You must fund county fire. You must support the rural residents, whether it's with fire protection, not asking us for another tax, or to repair the roads. Spanish Ranch Road up in the summit area is at risk. The volunteer fire department has told them it is not safe to bring the water tender over that road that is in such shambles. That needs to be addressed. So in the spirit of national or preparedness month, please spend some attention and some money on the rural dwellers and the environment and the roads in the rural areas. I also want to uh, speak a little bit about, I support uh, on the consent agenda number 37, the pop-up bike, protect a bike lane. I think that's gonna be really fun and I'm very interested to see how that comes along and hope that the Regional Transportation Commission's Bike Advisory Committee was part of that. Number 34, I feel really needs more discussion. Selling surplus property um, without any property description or maps for the public, putting it out to bid for a minimum of $50,000 and allowing it to have any kind of development on it at all. This is not right and it needs to be more transparent. So I would like better discussion of item number 34, please put up a map for us and tell us more about that. It's government owned properties being sold at surplus to who knows where. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Joanne Walfeld from Scotts Valley. I'm talking here today about the 5G proposed cell towers. There are two kinds of thought in America. Those who want a co-collective America to work toward peace, security, health, and a better future for our kids. There's another group who are destructive, push, and make fibs up about GMOs, pesticides, forced medicine and forced radiation upon the global humans, the global animals, the global birds, the bacteria kingdom to destroy almost all forms of life on earth. State the real radiation expert scientist. We are speaking about levels of radiation that are uninhabitable to life all life except the billionaire globalists who want a one world government, a one world currency, and a one world religion. And those globalists have underground living access when the millimeter wave frequency radiation frequencies from the 5G start to take life. 
It looks like we are going into a dark Luciferian religion by the dark scientists who don't have our interest at heart. Think about the companies who force cancer-causing electronics or sue a city who refuses to put these electronics on their constituents. This is dark, this is evil. The cell tower that went into Soquel that we came here to appeal on April 27th of this year, my hairdresser on the other end of the block of Wilson's Tire only gets about a half a, a, a half of unit in her cell phone. The cell phone is roving to find the cell tower so she can make appointments for, for her clients. That means that these people close to that cell antenna aren't getting better reception, worse, and they're getting more radiation. If we allow the 5G, 5G cell towers with Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, Jeff Bezos who owns Whole Foods and Amazon, to put those 15,000 collectively, those two together, millimeter satellites connecting to Santa Cruz County's small cells, we will be witness to our family, our friends, our dogs and cats dying of cancer and suffering from other maladies. Our bodies are biology, we have cells, and this is gonna cause destruction. 5G is evil to our health and loss of freedom from the spine of, in our businesses and homes. This is anti-democratic, and this is the anti-premise that the US Constitution was founded on. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Randa Salak. I'm here because I thought that the Janus people were gonna be here this week and I see that they're postponed until next week. But I want you to support the workers when they come here to you next week. And I'll just say a couple of sentences. It's been more than two months since Janus of Santa Cruz moved to impose a contract on its workers that increased their medical costs and provided only a 1% raise. That's not nearly enough to stem the constant turnover of caregivers that's forcing patients to wait longer and longer for vital recovery services. But Janus workers are not giving up. You'll hear from them next week. Please support them when you can. They're doing a vital service to this community and I know that you all know that. Thank you. Thank you. This will be our final speaker unless, is there anyone else who'd like to speak to us today? Please get in line if you can. Sir. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, my name is Mike Duffy. Cal. Okay, uh, I had a few things to wonder about. The other day I uh, went up to uh, Palo Alto to the Vet Center. Saw they spend a 5% for the arts. They're spending on a lot, of, a lot of good stuff. There's a kinetic art, uh, solar powered kinetic little toys running around. And uh, they had a huge marble statue with a, and a large bronze. So, so they'd be spending 5% for the arts. And uh, a nice bus ride, and uh, air condition, and, and the stereo was on good. And then uh, after we uh, left, we came back through through the mountains, you know, back on 17. And uh, yeah. Eventually, uh, got back to SoCal at my house, and I'm waiting for the farm. I've been hearing about it for the farm for a long time that it's going to be a community center. They said originally that if we allowed the low-income housing, that they would build a community center. Never done that. And uh, instead, I, I, I was just up there the other day, and they've uh, spent the 5% for the arts there. They've got huge uh, couple of pieces of petrified wood, like, about five feet by five feet, there's big boulders. They've got a couple of those up there. I guess that's, that's art. So, uh, and then I'm gonna uh, walk down the street in my house and a, a huge tree that was right at the end of the Monterey Avenue, a huge tree was just cut down. I mean, the thing was older than me. 
and there was no reason to cut it down. It was no, nothing dying or anything like that, but they just cut it down. Ironically, on the other side of the street, right where the freeway entrance goes, there's a, a trail that goes to Mount Calvary Lutheran Church. And that trail has had a, a large tree, well, three feet diameter, fall over the path. So you can't get through there unless you, you know, duck down and crawl under it. It's ridiculous. I mean, I, I would like to, but the, at the same time, right 10 feet away up the street, they cut down a tree just the other day, a huge tree that was, you know, given a lot of error for the, for the area and, and, and trees for birds and all the good stuff about trees as it was there. And it was older than me. But all of a sudden I went there the other day, it's chopped down. And no, no reason. And I, I asked uh, the person who's uh, running there, is it taken over? She, she doesn't know why it happened. Plus they started doing the sewage. And so they tore up all the street again. Thank you. What have I been done, three minutes already? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Hopefully you get something done with farm or anything. Okay. Good morning. I've never been in this room. My name is James Ewing Whitman. I'm glad to be here. I've been doing community service ever since I was a kid in the Boy Scouts and in my church. I know a little bit about a lot of subjects. Um, I was at a conference yesterday. Ollie Johansson spoke. He's a, been studying EMF effects with hundreds of other scientists for um, more than 40 years. I listened to a video that he did. It was about, about almost an hour and a half. That was 2014 information. So I came yesterday um, and I presented the wrong information to him. Um, found out that five years later, they still don't have a lot of answers. And he said that if you submitted your questions, you'd be able to speak and he'd answer your questions. I didn't submit questions to him, I submitted answers. So I'm just standing in front of you guys because I'm aware of a lot of things and I want some you guys to be aware of the effects of stuff that's going on with the existing wireless and with the 5G. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. So that concludes public comment. I'm gonna bring it back to the board for action. This, is, this will be action on the consent agenda, items 13 through 45. I'm gonna see if any of my colleagues have any comments they'd like to make. Professor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just a couple of comments. Uh, first on item, uh, <coughs> excuse me. 21, which is an agreement with our correctional officers. I wanna thank our uh, uh, personnel office for their work in negotiating this contract and the hard work of our correctional officers every day uh, to make sure that our jail is, is well run. Uh, appreciate the work there. On item number uh, 31, uh, this uh, update and evaluation report on the HOPES uh, program, uh, while it's, it's still early in terms of, uh, uh, of the evaluation, uh, I was very pleased to see the number of people who were uh, uh, moved into treatment, uh, to uh, moved into mental health services, moved into uh, housing, uh, supportive housing. I think this is the kind of results that we need to see in, in terms of these programs. I appreciate the hard work of our staff. On item number 34, this, uh, this item about this surplus property has uh, had a lot of discussions. The Planning Commission had this more than twice, or at least twice. Um, there had been a lot of discussion about it, um, and I'm glad to see it's moving forward. I appreciate the staff at Public Works who've figured out all the, the different issues uh, related to the property. On item number 37, I also want to express my appreciation for the for the enthusiastic support that the, the staff has had in creating these pop-up protected bike lanes um, that Bike Santa Cruz County is gonna be doing on 17th Avenue. Uh, people in the community are really looking forward to it. I think it'll make a really big difference. That's it. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, item number 27, I wanna thank Brian Largay of Felton for being willing to serve on the County Water Commission, Advisory Commission. Uh, also on uh, item number 31, uh, the Homeless Outreach Protective Engagement Services. I wanna congratulate them for getting a merit award from the California State Association of Counties. Uh, several years ago when former Supervisor Neil Coonerty and I worked with Bob Lee, then District Attorney, 
um, to launch the Community Partnership um, for Accountability, Connection, and Treatment Program, or PACT. Uh, we envision a program that would really um, link the courts to the service providers, and I think it's done a very good job of doing that. Uh, we need to continue with that effort, and I just want to congratulate um, those who are associated with that for getting that uh, recognition from the state. Uh, number 35, I'm glad to see that we're continuing our progress on road repairs related to the 2017 storm. Uh, I want to reiterate my hope that um, we keep um, our efforts going to resolve um, the policy matters with FEMA and the Federal Highway Administration. Uh, they've been not exactly uh, exactly what we wanted at, up to this point, but we just hope that we can have better results in the near future. Thank you. Supervisor Caput. Uh, I'll just make a quick comment on uh, <coughs> items uh, 24 and 25. Welcome aboard uh, Barry Perlman uh, for the Historic Resources Commission. And also uh, uh, welcome John uh, Lichtenberg as the uh, appointee to the Commission on Disabilities. Uh, thank you to both of them for their uh, volunteer work. Great. And uh, just a brief comment I, on item number 31, the HOPES uh, report. I just want to thank Jasmine Nahara and her tremendous team for doing the work out every day uh, that improves lives and makes our community safer. And so I really appreciate uh, your leadership and the, the good initial outcomes we're seeing um, from the program. Okay, with that, I'd entertain a motion. I'd move the consent agenda. So, so a motion and it's as amended with the... Uh, sure. With the changes we got earlier. So we got a motion by Leopold, second by McPherson. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. Moving on to item number seven. This is a public hearing to consider a, an appeal of the tax administrator decision related to the transit occupancy tax penalties and interest assessed against APN 102031-24 as outlined in a memorandum of the auditor controller tax collector. Uh, and because this is appeal, we're gonna have our uh, Ms. Driscoll make a five minute presentation and then the appellant can make a five minute presentation uh, and then we'll hear from members of the public. Good morning. Edith Driscoll, Auditor Controller, Treasurer Tax Collector. This item is an appeal of the final determination made by the tax administrator for transient occupancy tax due in the amount of $726.09 and the related late fees and interest of $369.81. These amounts due are the result of short-term rental activity on parcel number 102-03124, a short-term rental located at 149 Ponza Lane in Soquel since 2016. Mr. Gregory and Ms. Naima Hiver, the owners of the property, have filed this appeal stating that the tax administrator did not have the authority to assess the TOT against them prior to 2018 when they received their hosted rental permit from the county and that the interest and penalties should be waived as their failure to pay was unintentional. To provide your board and the public with some basic information on the county's transient occupancy tax, I have the following. The unincorporated portion of the County of Santa Cruz has 1,017 short-term rental properties. Each are responsible for paying their transient occupancy tax. First, the county's transient occupancy tax was first adopted by the Board of Supervisors in 1964 and is laid out in the Santa Cruz County Code Section 4.24, which states that anyone operating a rental for short-term occupancy, as defined as 30 days or less, must register with the county within 30 days after commencing business and remit the TOT on a monthly basis. Delinquent TOT payments are subject to penalties and interest under this code section. Secondly, the county code for TOT applies to any person operating a transient occupancy facility. The code defines that facility as any home or portion thereof used for transient lodging or sleeping purposes. Finally, California State Revenue and Tax Code 7283.51 authorizes the tax administrator to collect unpaid TOT within four years of the date on which the TOT was required to be paid. In other words, I can go back three years. 
In summary, the county code authorizes the TOT to be charged and what facilities the TOT applies to. The state revenue and tax code authorizes how many years I as the tax administrator am allowed to go back and collect the tax and necessary interest and penalties. The appeal before you today challenges the TOT assessed for years prior to 2018. In this case, it is undisputed that the taxpayers have been operating their short-term <coughs> rental since 2016. Rather, the Hivers assert that the tax administrator cannot go back the full three years to assess the TOT. The Hivers submitted two written appeals to myself, the Auditor Controller, Treasurer Tax Collector, which were both denied. They have now brought this item to the board as their final appeal. I, as the tax administrator, respectfully request your board deny the Hivers appeal and adopt the proposed findings and order as outlined in your board letter today. Thank you. Thank you. We have the appellants here. You want to come forward? Good morning. Good morning. So you have five minutes. Yeah. Um, First of all, I, I, I never said that I didn't owe these tax obligations. Um, I don't think Ms. Driscoll read my appeal closely. Uh, she was referring to um, another letter I sent to her office, um, and I think she took it out of context. I do owe the back taxes, um, but I'm here to appeal the um, the interest and late fees, which are approximately 300 and $369.81. Um, I have three reasons for this. Um, first, we, you know, my wife and I decided we needed to run an Airbnb because we needed the income. Uh, we still need additional income just to survive here. We're trying to keep our house. So when Airbnb came out years ago, we were unaware of it, but my son uh, pointed us to it as a possible source of income. So we run a hosted rental. Um, that means having people downstairs at various times, whether they're, you know, partying or ripping the house apart, this is something we have to put up with um, because we need the income. So we wouldn't run a hosted rental if we didn't have to. Um, Airbnb uh, came out first. so. Airbnb uh, was dedicated to these short-term rentals, whether you're renting a couch in, in your um, unit or whether, whether you're renting the entire house. Um, so they built a website and a financial infrastructure from the ground up that serviced the hosts. And that included paying the local taxes to Santa Cruz. HomeAway, which we joined later, to increase our, um, our reach, um, they, they came as a, a sort of a, a second type of, um, what they wanted to become was an Airbnb themselves. They focused on the vacation rental market um, and that was their history, but they didn't support um, uh, the, really the short-term hosting uh, of uh, ho these hosted rentals, but they tried to mimic everything on their website. So they, they were Airbnb wannabe that put, tried to build a Airbnb infrastructure, but couldn't because they were overlaying it onto their vacation rental um, websites or website. So long story short is even though they tried to mimic um, the Airbnb in terms of everything else, they weren't doing the same thing in terms of the services that were there, they were providing. And they were very poor at communicating that to the hosts. So we did not know that they weren't paying our local taxes in the same way that Airbnb was. It was very confusing to us. And they had multiple iterations of their website that we, did, we, we just could not follow what they were providing and what they weren't. So it was a misunderstanding on our part that HomeAway was paying our local taxes in the same way Airbnb was. And so it's an illusion of equivalence and, and that, that was leading us not to pay these taxes. And we were at their mercy because they were not providing us information about, about our obligations to pay those taxes. And that's essentially my first point. My second point is that we, we built our home in 2001 in the Soquel Mountains. 
We've paid our local, our, our property taxes on time every year over those, the, the course of those 18 years. That's over $200,000 we've given on time to the county. Okay, so we, we paid taxes on time. We've never had a problem with the tax auditor, ever. You can check the records. So we're, we're honest people. We do things honestly. Third point is we don't do things illegally, okay? I was one of the first 10 permits that was issued for, for uh, short-term hosted rentals in the county. Of the 250, so all 250 now are used up, but I was there in line within the, the first 10. So the reason I'm here to quibble about a $368 late fee and interest payment is because I'm not a tax cheat. And the, the, the auditor is taking what I said to her out of context and using it against me. I did not say that I don't owe those back taxes, I do. But to be penalized is incorrect from, from, from her because I'm not a tax cheat. The crime does not fit the punishment because there was no crime on my part. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We'll now open it up uh, for public comment. Is there anyone who'd like to speak to us about this item? Thank you. I want to thank the appellant for taking this brave action. You've heard very good, clear communication that he's not trying to cheat you. He's standing up for a principle, and I applaud that. I really do. And I hope that you will take the reasonable course of action and um, vacate the penalties and interest. That's punitive. And as he said, he's done his best in good faith to honor it. He's done his best in good faith to abide by the, the very new hosted rental uh, language. And he's done his best in good faith to be a property owner and taxpayer. So please uphold his justice and deny the ability of the county tax assessor to collect the penalties and interest. It only seems right. Thank you very much. Thank you. So that concludes, I'll close the public comment and bring it back to the board for deliberation and action. Supervisor Leopold. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. I have just a couple questions. Um, uh, well, when we originally wrote the vacation rental law, you know, the question of TOT uh, taxes, uh, you know, most everybody told me they were paying their taxes. And then we found out through that process that not everybody was. Um, and we went through a, uh, an effort as people came in and now had to show their TOT certificate um, uh, to find out whether they paid their taxes. And what did we do in that circumstance back in 2012? Uh, around TOT collection? Sure, that was prior to my time. That was under a previous uh, just tax collector at that time. And there was a large amount of, me of uh, public information provided letting people know that they are, what, this is what the law is and they are required to come in and do that. The county, I believe we, we almost doubled the number of TOT certificates that we had issued. Previously, they were issued to more traditional um, hotel motels and uh, with this new uh, landscape in short-term rentals, that number almost doubled the number of people who are now uh, renting. Yeah, and so pe people didn't, um, uh, may not have uh, knowingly been, uh, or uh, been aware or conscious that they were breaking the law. They honestly thought they were paying their taxes and then they, when our rules came out, it was clear that short-term uh, under 30 days, uh, you have to pay TOT. They may not have observed that they needed to pay taxes. Yeah, yeah. But the law didn't change. Yeah. Um, the the question about Airbnb that, that when we when we first regulated in this area, Airbnb wasn't really much of a, a concern back in 2011. Uh, it became a greater concern, but uh, they didn't always collect the TOT. I'm wondering if council remembers when we uh, negotiated with them to start collecting the TOT. If I can, re <clears throat> if I can recall, I think it was it was about two years ago, mm -hmm. and uh, 
maybe maybe the auditor has a uh -huh. better reason. Yeah, I met to. with uh, Dana McCray and myself. We we met with the Airbnb folks several years ago. That would have been about five years ago when Mary Jo Walker was still here. And again, Airbnb had always been in place. They just came to the county and, and we worked at an arrangement where they would pay us directly for the business owners who chose to contract with them as their vendor. And since that time, uh, the other platforms, there's, uh, he mentioned uh, there's HomeAway, many. VRBO, all those things. They don't have an agreement like that with Correct, the, the they county. Correct, they do not. Um, uh, you know, I, I have a lot of empathy for uh, the Hivers uh, because um, they're, they're faced in a situation like many in Santa Cruz, which we're trying to hold on uh, to being here. Uh, it's an expensive place to live. And uh, we have found a way to create regulations to allow people <coughs> to operate commercial businesses in residential neighborhoods. Um, in part in recognition of the support that that plays in helping people make their regular payments uh, for their homes and being able to provide. Um, we've, we've spent a lot of time on, on that. We've worked very hard uh, to uh, create a reasonable set of uh, regulations. Um, when I look at this uh, case, um, it's, uh, uh, although I feel empathy, I think we, uh, we have the rules uh, that if you don't pay the taxes, there are, uh, there are penalties and late fees. And um, in, in, in looking at that, it seems very important to me uh, that uh, it, it, not to create a precedent that people come and then we have to judge whether they're been honest and, and unknowing or whether, um, you know, how we judge whether that would take place. I did look at the um, the planning department's website in the form, and I would like to recommend that we make changes uh, to that form because where it talks about paying TOT, we should have a line in there that says, you need to be aware of to whether the platform you're using is uh, uh, collects the tax for you or whether you are gonna be have to paying it yourself as a way of, um, of making people aware that there's a difference in these platforms that's important, that has a, a substantial effect on, on um, their lives and uh, that through the work uh, that the county does as part of the, uh, the enforcement of our ordinances, we will find uh, people uh, and uh, that they should be prepared uh, in that case. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I am interested in upholding the appeal. I mean, not upholding the appeal, is denying the appeal and, uh, and having our planning department make changes with the website or the forms to make sure it's clear that people have the responsibility and that the platforms have different responsibilities. Is that a motion? Yeah, I would make that a motion. Okay, we have a motion. Well, hold on, let me, let me first, we got a motion and a, a second. Motion by Leopold, second by McPherson. Now it's uh, Supervisor Caput, your turn to speak. What I'm getting at is we got a legal side and we also have a human side here. Uh, uh, we, we, we have the discretion to uh, reject the appeal, but maybe accept the fact that we could waive the uh, uh, penalty and interest. Uh, would you be willing to put that in your motion? Uh, I, I don't think we'd be setting a precedent uh, only because we're looking at about 20 pages here of an explanation. And uh, how much does it cost to appeal? This is the first appeal we've done for TOT, so we have no fee for it in the fee schedule yet. So they're not out on a, paying a fee for appeal? Correct. Okay. Oh, oh, I have a motion on the table, uh, Supervisor Cap, but I understand uh, the concerns. I'm worried about the precedent. And uh, in my uh, conversations with our attorneys um, and our tax collector, I think that that's important. I don't take any joy or comfort sure. uh, in, in that. And 
Uh, I've dealt with a lot of vacation rental issues in my district. I may have more than anybody else. Um, and there are, I've, uh, there, are, there are lots of issues that people have out there. And um, it is tough to make the judgment call uh, about uh, um, uh, when people unknowingly or knowingly have uh, made changes. And I think that, that uh, or are aware of what the, the rules are and the rules are on the books. And if you're operating a business, it's, Im it's imperative for people to understand what those rules are. Okay, so we have a motion and a second on the floor. Uh, I'm gonna ask all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that no. passes. Oh, sorry, one no. So that passes four to one. We'll, we'll now move on to item number eight, which is a continued public hearing to consider the resolution amending the general plan, local coastal plug, plant program, land use element, noise element, circulation element, public safety element, and sequent notice of exemption and determination ordinance amending Santa Cruz County codes, chapters 13.10 and 13.12 to create the airport combining zone district and to rezone properties within two miles of the Wattsville Municipal Airport to be included within the combining district. Uh, ordinance creating a new chapter 13.15 noise planning and ordinance amending chapter 16.01 environment Environmental review and schedule the three ordinances for final adoption on September 24th, 2019, as outlined in a memorandum of uh, the planning director. Mr. Carlson. Thank you for reading that, Chair. Um, so the public hearing on this project was continued from uh, August 27th to make some changes to the new noise planning ordinance, part of the package, um, as directed by the board in, in the motion. Um, the motion requested no changes to airport or environmental review guidelines, um, parts of the project. Therefore, the present, I, I won't cover those parts of the project in detail in this presentation. I'll just summarize those and then I'll um, address changes made to the noise planning ordinance and uh, respond to some public comments that have come in on the project uh, since August 27th. And so to briefly summarize, um, Policies addressing safety and noise in the unincorporated area around the Watsonville Municipal Airport would be updated and consolidated in the land use element. And the new section of the land use element is provided in Exhibit B of Attachment A. Uh, air travel policies would be relocated from the circulation element to the airport section of the land use element. Um, and other amendments would be made to the rail facilities um, section of the circulation element. And this is provided in Exhibit C of Attachment A. Uh, with a strikeout underlined version provided in attachment H. Um, and Santa Cruz County Code Chapter 13.12 would be amended to implement the updated policies and establish the airport combining zone district as a new zoning overlay on properties near the airport. And the amended ordinance is provided in attachment B with a strikeout version provided in attachment C. Um, and County Code Chapter 16.01 would be amended to establish that the county's environmental review guidelines would be the most recent version of CEQA and the state CEQA guidelines. Um, and the amended ordinance is provided in attachment E with an underlying strike out version provided in attachment F. Uh, the noise policies in the safety element would be moved to a standalone noise element and a new Santa Cruz County Code Chapter 13.15 noise planning would be impl would implement the policies of the noise element. Uh, the new noise element is provided in exhibit D of attachment A with a strikeout version of the existing safety element provided in attachment J and the new noise ordinance is provided in attachment D of the staff report. At the public hearing on August uh, 24th, the board requested several changes in the new noise ordinance and a strikeout underlying version of the ordinance showing the changes made since that public hearing is provided in attachment E. Um, I'll just briefly summarize those. Two definitions were added for A weighting and LDN. Uh, the hours for noise sources associated with permitted construction activities were changed per the direction in the motion. Uh, the language exempting noise sources from entertainment and special events such as school activities and non-commercial private gatherings is clarified. Um, to note that County Code Chapter 8.30 regulating offensive noise uh, still applies as well as any requirements of a special event permit. Um, and likewise, the exemption for noise sources associated with minor repairs to residential property was changed um, with a reference to Chapter 8.30, again, regulating offensive noise. 
um, the noise standards for emergency generators were corrected um, to delete the reference to LDN, making the standard a maximum of, of 60 decibels um, at any time at the property line. Um, and, and the standards for HVAC equipment were, uh, was amended to clarify the noise from these units shall be mitigated by locating them away from sleeping rooms and using other noise insulation measures um, if feasible. And lastly, public comments um, have been submitted claiming allowable noise levels would increase as a result of the proposed amendments. And the amendments do not increase allowable noise levels. Um, the standards for wineries are actually being clarified to reinforce uh, the intent of the standards. The existing zoning ordinance provides allowable noise level standards for wineries that are quite high. Um, these existing standards would logically apply to equipment at the winery itself measured at the source, like crushing and bottling equipment, and backup beepers, um, and things like that. And this is how the planning department has applied those standards on projects. We reinforce this in the new noise element with policy 9.3.1 by restating the existing standards and clarifying they apply to noise measurements at the source and that noise levels at the property line shall not exceed the standards in table 9-3, uh, which is located on page 69 of your board packet. This table is the same as the existing table in the general plan safety element where the noise standards are currently located. Existing property line noise standards in table 9-3 um, for stationary sources such as a winery operation are not changing. The purpose of policy 9.3.1 is to ensure noise standards for wineries are not interpreted to allow higher property line noise levels for wineries compared to other uses. And so the staff recommendation um, uh, is to conduct a public hearing to consider the pros proposed amendments to the general plan local coastal program and the Santa Cruz County Code, affirm that the proposed amendments are exempt from CEQA. The exemption is provided in exhibit A of attachment A and adopt the resolution amending the general plan and local coastal program and directing staff to submit the local coastal program amendments to the coastal commission for certification and approve the ordinances amending the county code and local coastal implementation plan and rezoning properties to add the airport combining zone district in concept and direct the clerk of the board to place the ordinances on the next scheduled board of supervisors meeting agenda for second reading and final adoption. That concludes my presentation. Okay, I'll ask if there are any questions. No, I'll just say I appreciate the, um, the changes that were made in uh, this section 13.15, uh, I think it makes it better and clearer, and uh, I think it'll help uh, provide for clarity when it has to be enforced. Great. Um, I will now open it up for public comment. Is there anyone who would like to speak to us about this item? Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner, resident of Rural Aptos. Thank you for the presentation. And again, I wanna thank the board for bringing this back for some changes and clarification because it is a countywide noise ordinance change. So um, I, I wanna make sure that uh, amplified music is properly addressed in rural areas for this. I know that has been a problem in many of the rural areas. And if you can speak to that a little bit about how that has changed or if at all, how it would be measured, how it would be required to be tested uh, for special events in the rural areas or for uh, wineries that are allowed um, conditional use permits for special events. And I also, um, I, I thought I heard you say something about the rail corridor, maybe I didn't hear that, but I want to know how this could affect uh, properties adjacent to the rail corridor in the event there were uh, uh, return of passenger rail using diesel locomotives. Thank you very much. That concludes public comment. I'll bring it back to the board for deliberation and action. I'll make a quick comment. And uh, yeah, uh, I wanna thank you for your report. I think it's fair. I think it's very, uh, it's accepted by uh, most people and also the airport and uh, so. Uh, um, I, th I think it's good. We've clarified the rules, and uh, we haven't. Uh, we haven't. We're actually helping out the airport in this in this case. So, thank you very much. Great, thank you. I'd entertain a motion. 
I'll move the recommended actions. Second Motion by French. Second. Sec second by Leopold. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, we will now move on to item number nine, which is considered two resolutions accepting $300,000 from the Health Services Agency to the general fund plant budget independent contractor agreement with Gensler in the not to exceed amount of $1,008,513 million for development of long range facilities and camp campus master plans and to take related actions as recommended by the deputy CAO and the director of public works. Mr. Machado. <laughs> Thank you and good morning, Chair, Supervisors. Um, thank you for the introduction. Matt Machado, Director of Public Works. And uh, I'm joining today uh, our new Director of Capital Projects, Travis Carey. I will start with a brief introduction and then turn the mic over to him. So the item before you is consideration of a contract to complete the long range facilities and campus master plans. <clears throat> uh, this is truly a significant milestone in the planning of county facilities and related assets. Uh, the purpose is to ensure that county services are planned efficiently and effectively. It is also a step forward to identify surplus lands to better serve community needs, such as needs of housing and economic development needs. And so with that brief intro, uh, I will turn the mic over to Travis Carey, who has a PowerPoint presentation to share. Great, thank you, Matt. Good morning, Chair and Board. Um, do you wanna do that? Um, so here's a brief agenda for today. Um, we're going to first provide a, just a brief project overview um, to look at some of the components of the project and then <coughs> look a little bit about capital facility planning, uh, past and, and present, and then brief review on the opportunities and challenges study that, that really um, set the stage for this, this effort. And then look at the consultant uh, selection process and the scope of work that, that um, we all came up with. Uh, review some opportunities for community engagement and then look at the project management structure and our recommendations. Okay, so I want to just briefly uh, go over the, the primary project goals. Matt touched on this a little bit, but it's really to look at improving uh, our county service uh, that we provide to our constituents and then also um, utilizing our assets, specifically our real property assets uh, for community needs. So the project has really uh, been developed into three main components, the long range facility plan and the campus master plans, and then we'll be doing environmental impact analysis on the, the final campus master plans. Uh, you, can you go back just a sec? I just wanted to, just on the, on the campus master plans, uh, we're really focused on two properties, the Freedom Boulevard uh, property, um, which is in Watsonville, on Freedom Boulevard, and that's a, uh, about a nine and a half acre parcel, um, and it has 58,000 square feet of buildings uh, that are occupied by the county. And it also has very large uh, vacant areas of underutilized property um, on that site. There are existing 118 county employees um, work at that site. And then on the county government center, which of course is, is this property, it's just about a 10 acre piece of property um, at a pretty, pretty uh, prime corner in the city of Santa Cruz. We have a 230, uh, um, I, I wanna say we have uh, 800, uh, about 800 county employees um, that work in this facility. So that's a pretty big, uh, pretty big service uh, for employees. And then we're, we also have surrounding land. We have the jail facility, of course, and then there's several leased facilities as well that are in very close proximity to, to this campus. And, and of course, you all know very large uh, service parking lots. <laughs> so both of these properties really um, have, we think some really uh, good opportunity to uh, implement our project goals. Okay, thanks. So just taking a look at, at the sort of the history of capital facility planning, uh, our last major planning effort was the 1994 Long Range Facilities Plan, which um, really focused on our three main campuses. So the two I mentioned and also uh, at Emmeline. And uh, we have, it, it, it identified a lot of um, potential for projects, but also that a lot of our facilities were far beyond their useful life. And I wanted to point out that um, some of these facilities are actually still occupied uh, by, by county workers uh, and providing services out of these structures still to this day. So, uh, but even with that, um, 
We still have a lot of success with capital facility development. These are just uh, four examples of some really great work that we've still done. Uh, we've, we've completed even though we didn't really have too much of a plan. Most of this was done through opportunistic funding. So we find a grant, we have a program, we have a, a department out there, they find a need. And, and we have been able to deliver some really great stuff um, despite not having a plan. Um, but I think um, we've all seen that there's still a lot of work to be done on, on this stuff. So now into the future, we have our uh, strategic plan, which is really moving us forward. And uh, this project really provides direct support of the strategic plan in many of the focus areas, especially the, the county operational excellence area. So uh, specifically the county infrastructure area and the customer experience area. So um, again, just, just it has a direct tie in with, with the strategic plan. Next slide. And also uh, with the county uh, operational plan. So in public works, we have, we have several objectives and this number 140 um, is specific to this project. So this project is implementing this specific objective. Um, it goes through all the key steps. And the first step is complete now. Uh, your board ad adopted the opportunities and challenges study on April 23rd, 2019. So we're, we're well on the way to implementation of this. And then the next steps following are um, directly implemented by this project. So real, real quick, just a little bit of review on the opportunities and challenges study. It was, it was a, a pretty fun process to go through. A lot of the departments were involved. There was a couple of departmental workshops that we had, and we did a lot of work around departmental surveys that really focused on service delivery throughout the county. And we did a lot of uh, inventory work and, and researching about employment trends and looking at some of the geographic considerations. And then uh, a, a couple of the um, highlights I just wanted to, that, that were interesting out of the inventory was that the county owns 2,090 acres of land out there. And that's composed of 595 parcels. And we have, uh, we're currently operating 159 facilities, and that includes 16 leased facilities. So we're out there leasing property at uh, approximately $2.8 million a year we now pay for our leases. And um, we came up with some stats on the leases. It, it's interesting that about 16% of the county employees are actually working in le leased facilities. So that's, it's an interesting fact, um, what we do about it, uh, hopefully be part of the study and, and we, can, we can see uh, what we can come up with. And, uh, uh, one that really struck me is that 68% of county employees work in buildings that are greater than 50 years old. So that's, that's kind of telling to our um, ability to keep things running. And uh, there, there will be a link on the DPW website to the uh, opportunities and challenges study that just became live today. So if you're interested, you can see that or let me know and I'll send you a copy. So I just real quick on the consultant selection process, your board approved uh, back in April, the RFQ, we went through the selection process and it, it was very competitive and we are recommending Gensler as the most qualified firm to undertake this effort. They have a very, very strong team of consultants that they put together, especially in the areas of the fiscal impact analysis and environmental review, which is gonna be very uh, critical uh, for, this, for this project. And they also had a lot of experience with similar sized counties doing similar work. So we thought that was very applicable. So here's the, the, basically the process map of the scope of work that, that uh, we came up with. So phase one is really looking at project startup. That'll happen uh, starting tomorrow if, if it all goes well. And then looking at phase two is basically data collection. There'll be more departmental surveys, uh, interviews with leadership at the county, also some focus groups, and we'll be touring additional sites throughout the county to give the consultant team a good uh, idea of what we have. And then moving into phase three, we're really, they're starting to do the analysis of their findings and starting to assess the campuses. And then moving into the draft and the final long range plan will be in phase four. And then phase five and six are really about development of the master plans themselves. And then moving on to environmental impact report. And throughout this process, your board will have an opportunity to uh, receive both uh, regular check-ins and also um, be responsible for accepting the long range uh, property management plan and adopting the master plans as they become uh, finalized. 
So here's taking that process map and looking at more of a schedule. So what the change you'll see is that the campus master planning work actually moves underneath and will be uh, somewhat simultaneous with the development of the long range uh, property management plan. So that uh, a lot of that work will, will be occurring simultaneously. So that shortens our, our duration of the project. And then the phase seven of the environmental uh, impact reports I want to point out that there'll be two separate reports, one for each uh, campus master plan, because there's such different properties, both in terms of geography and, and use um, and, and potential that, that we might come up with. So that'll be a process um, that, that will be very interesting to see what happens. So here's an overview of basically it's the budget and then the consultant team. So this shows you, it's a very, uh, very, very strong team. We have Gensler as the prime, Grun and Grun are, are economic uh, experts. And then uh, we have various uh, civil engineering, cost data meaning, estimating uh, consultants. And then uh, importantly, Rincon Environmental uh, will be serving as the environmental planning consultant for this project. They'll be working with the team throughout, but specifically focused on the EIR work. And so we have a total consultant labor and expense budget of just over a million dollars. And we're hoping uh, we have an 18 to 24 month uh, project timeline. So here's our project management structure, uh, starting down at the bottom left with the county project team. We've developed a uh, interdepartmental working team, public works, the CO's office and general services. And then as needed folks the, coming from planning to help us with environmental review um, and, and other county members as, as needed. And then working co closely on the bottom right with the consultant team. And then moving up, we have the external agencies that we'll be coordinating with and a lot of opportunity for community engagement, which uh, we'll go over in a, in a second. And then that all feeds into a county steering committee, which has regular meetings throughout the process. And then moving up to the board of supervisors. So here's just a, just a review of all the community engagement opportunities. So throughout the project, there'll be, there'll be ample opportunity. There'll be community group meetings, of course, board of supervisors meetings throughout the long range uh, property management plan. And then uh, throughout the campus master planning, there'll also be town hall meetings that will be site specific to each of the properties. And then your board uh, meetings as well. And of course, the environmental impact analysis, the entire CEQA process is a very public open process with community meetings as well. So um, there's lots of uh, opportunity for folks to be involved. So next steps, we have the project kickoff meeting scheduled for September, September 23rd, and then September and October, we'll be doing additional interviews and surveys and also more data collection. And then our first steering committee meeting is also scheduled for October 28th. So we have our recommendations. Uh, number one, consider approval of the two resolutions of accepting unanticipated revenue in the amount of $300,000 from the health services agency to the general plant fund budget. And number two, consider approval of the independent contractor agreement with Gensler in the not to exceed amount of $1,008,513. And number three, authorize the deputy CAO director of public works to sign the original agreement on behalf of the county. And thank you for your consideration of these recommendations and we're available for questions. Supervisor Prime. Thank you, Chair. Thank you again for the presentation. Congratulations on the new position. It's deserved. Um, I do have one question on the phase two data collection component. One of the things that the board had discussed some months back when we were uh, initially uh, presented with this was the idea of getting a sense of where our employees actually live and whether that would be part of the data collection. It appeared as though we had something where they worked, but I didn't see necessarily where they lived, in, in large part because, we, to my knowledge, we're the second largest public employer in the county when you consider the university then to us. Um, obviously, anything that we can do uh, to help alleviate uh, some of the commute issues would be ideal. For those that live in the Mid and South County, if it means that a rearranging of where uh, those employees are able to go to work, to work in the county, I think could have a significant impact both on their quality of life and the community great in general. So I'd like to see as we do facilities master plans, some sort of data collection to see whether that can be tied into it as well. Yeah, we actually did do some of that work in the opportunities and challenges study. It wasn't on the slide, but uh, we did look at the, uh, the uh, place of residence of the employees um, without disclosing too much personal information, of course, but we were able to, to 
uh, assemble that data and we do have figures on that where employees live versus where they work. Um, it's, it's very interesting. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you. Uh, 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 thank you for the presentation and congratulations on the job. The, um, I had a couple questions. The first part of this is doing um, the long range property management plan, which is looking at all of our properties and trying to assess. Uh, the report uh, talks about uh, the disposition uh, portion of the study um, to support these projects. And um, to me, uh, the disposition of uh, certain uh, properties that we might consider surplus um, may be, have better uses than, than supporting these two projects. And I wanna make sure that as we do that long range property management plan that we're not locking ourselves into getting rid of our excess property because we have two big projects we have to support. Some of those properties will be parks properties um, and uh, as someone in, uh, who represents district who's already given up um, park properties for housing and for other, uh, uh, other activities, I'm sensitive to the fact of park properties not being used to support parks in a parks deficient district. So I just wanna be sure that we're not locking ourselves into something that, that we have two projects and everything goes to those two projects. Right, so the, the, um, the capital facility plan um, will, potentially have recommendations on surplus property um, with some analysis, hopefully to back that up, but it will not be an adopted plan, it'll be accepted by your board and any kind of action. So there's no action proposed out of that plan. Um, so any, any follow-up actions would of course have to go through the entire process with your board. Um, thanks, I appreciate that. And uh, I think it'll be very important to see that list when it comes out. The uh, it, it, there is a slide that talked about debt analysis, and I had brought this up in a, in a previous discussion when we talked about the landfill, um, about debt analysis. Uh, uh, there's a lot of people who, uh, there's a lot of departments, and there's a lot of needs that, uh, that want to take advantage of the fact that in less than 10 years, we'll be done with two thirds of our debt. And I, and I think it needs to be, I, I hope that we're gonna be looking at all those needs because um, uh, I don't want it to be a race to who gets there first. Right, so we'll be certainly working with the CAO office to ensure that there's equity amongst all that debt need and uh, ensure that it's a part of the larger plan. Yeah, well, I'm hoping that, that, that we have that discussion here at this board, that it isn't, um, that, we, that we make a decision about where we wanna uh, place our debt as we look at the whole picture, not just this um, uh, th uh, these uh, two, the, the, the facility plans for these two properties. I think that's gonna be important. And, um, and I know we like to have debt uh, uh, and it's part of what we do. And uh, I, I wanna make sure that we uh, use it in the best way possible. Um, the last part I had is about public input um, uh, along the way in this, uh, I think the, there are some very exciting things that could happen with these properties and um, they have uh, interest to, uh, probably beyond the, uh, the 300 feet of the, uh, of the, of the affected properties. Um, the, uh, the steering committee that you're putting together, will that have representatives of our constituent unions, our, our workers who will be part of that discussion? Um, we've we've talked about the makeup of the steering committee, um, and I think it's still under discussion. Definitely, um, we've definitely talked about um, making sure that we have a pretty robust input on this because we want this project and anything comes out of it to be successful. So, um, we're at the same time, trying to have a nimble uh, response to the consultants. Um, so I, I'm not sure if it's part of the steering committee, um, but the steering committee again is gonna be taking all of the input that we can receive and, and making sure it's, it's robust and comprehensive. Well, I mean, one of the things that I appreciate that uh, it, our county administrative officer, I think did a really good job in when he became CAO going around to all the departments and at least in my conversations with him, housing was a big issue um, and um, ensuring that there's participation of the employees to help think about this, I think will result not only in a better plan, 
but, uh, but uh, better buy-in. And uh, I think it helps morale to know that, that at the highest levels of county government, we're taking this very seriously about meeting the needs of our employees. And so I would, I would encourage thinking about uh, whether there's um, uh, one or two people from that, uh, that are nominated from the employees or their constituent unions to be part of that steering committee to, to represent that voice in the process. I think it would be helpful. That's all I have. Supervisor Caput. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, certainly we're gonna accept the money and uh, uh, the only question I have is uh, <clears throat> we're talking about a lot of consultant fees here. Are, in your opinion, they're all reasonable when you look at all of them? Yes, when, uh, when we worked with the consultant, we looked at every detail to ensure that we were getting maximum value for our dollars. So we believe that it's a good, uh, it's a good scope, it's a good budget, and it's a, it's a tight timeline, which is also a good thing for, for all of us as well. Okay, and this is, uh, you, uh, in the future, if we have something like this again, is, is there some part of the consultant work that the actual county can do itself without having to hire out. So, so even this effort is going to require a lot of input from county staff. Uh, this will be um, from each department, from uh, the project management team. There's a lot of input already required. Uh, this document will live for for hopefully many years as a guide, and so we can, as we continue to um, evolve projects, then. Uh, County staff will continue to be involved and will work towards implementing future projects as well as the two site master plans that we'll be working on first. Okay, and then with the, uh, a big part of this is the Freedom uh, Mental Health uh, Facility, part of the campus. Uh, there, uh, it's still delayed. We're going on probably about 10 months now. Uh, is it going to open soon? Or uh, I know I, I'm not I'm not blaming anybody. I'm just saying this has been going on a long time. My understanding is they've wrapped it up for the most part at this point. There was some landscaping, a bit of uh, concrete work being done, but the uh, the building itself has been um, accepted. And so I think we're we're in a good position there. This project's really a, a separate um, element, trying to push forward a longer range plan to further develop that campus. But the project that you're referring to, I believe is, is for the most part wrapped up at this point. And then uh, lastly, uh, uh, with the uh, delay, are we, are we actually paying out money uh, to consultants and others uh, while this delay uh, of about, we'll say nine to 10 months has taken place on the Freedom Campus. So um, the new building that was constructed there recently, uh, we do not have consultants on board with that project. That's staff led. Uh, and so we're not paying at this point for, for any extra services that, that we don't need today. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And congratulations, Mr. Kerry, for uh, the new position. And um, I'm glad to see this moving forward, for not only for the public at large, but for our employees as well. Um, the, the numbers, uh, we have a lot of acreage, almost 2,100 and uh, almost 600 parcels. Has there been, have we gotten rid of any parcels in the recent years? Or are we adding, have we been adding on in general? Or have we been adding or losing? Just uh, well, that's that's a it's a mostly a data issue. We have acquired some some nice uh, properties, but th there's really out out of that two, almost like you said, 2,100 uh, acres. Um, a lot of that is is um, located up in up in the mountainous areas. And we when I first started here, we actually had over a thousand parcels, um, and those the number of parcels was reduced by combining parcels. So the, the, the number of parcels have gone down, the acreage hasn't changed substantially. We don't often surplus property. Um, and so any new acquisitions that we have are, are mostly small in nature. Um, and then, you know, every once in a while we'll buy something important, but there hasn't been a significant change in, in real property. 
Yeah, good. And I'm, uh, I would I would add though, supervisor, that you know there are two properties that were connected with the redevelopment agency. One that was nine acres at Seventh and Bromer, another that nearly four acres at Capitola Road, in which we are in the process of disposing of. And we had an item on today's agenda about a surplus property on Thirty Fourth Avenue. Thank you. Um, well, good. I'm just glad to see that um, uh, we're taking into consideration the housing and where people are living too, because we know this is a nightmare. It's adding an hour, two hours a day at least to some of these folks. Um, but um, that's going to be good in, um, to, to get that input about where people are residing today and are likely tomorrow with probably the housing opportunities throughout the, uh, the county. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just only going to add, uh, I think, Governments often forget that they are uh, asset managers uh, of, of large, large amounts of property and thinking about how to use those assets in a way that benefits the community, our workforce, um, and our overall mission to provide services, I think is really important. And so I'm very supportive of this effort because I think it's a, it's a big opportunity um, that we need to be thinking more about uh, as, a, as, a, as an entity. So thank you, thank you for bringing this forward. And congratulations on the new role. Thank you. Uh, we'll now open it up for public comment. Is there anyone from the public who'd like to speak to us? Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner, resident of rural Aptos. Thank you for the presentation. It's um, shocking <laughs> as a member of the public to find out how much land the uh, county government owns and how much it leases is also pretty incredible. The amount of money spent on leasing properties, I think really needs to be examined. And so my question is, and this probably goes hand in hand with strategic plan, does the county plan to expand the amount of space that it needs to provide the level of service that the county foresees needed for the public in the future. How does that fit in with strategic plan? And that seems that it would be a guiding factor for this type of study. What are we going to need? What do we anticipate in level of services and locations of service? I applaud uh, finding out where your employees work. I happen to know some of them commute from the Central Valley. Um, but I think we have to keep in mind that th these services are for the public. And while it is unfortunate that people are who work for the county are having to drive or come in from way far away, we have to keep in mind that they are doing so as a service to the public. And so to locate those services to make it easier for the people who work here is a disservice to the public. And I think we have to keep that in mind. I think there needs to be a cost benefit analysis done for some of these leased properties um, or recently um, acquired properties. I, I know that the sheriff's substations is a relatively new thing. I, rem I remember when that first started happening and I would like some information on how much those are really used by members of the public. The county just spent a lot of money uh, securing the Aptos Village Safety Center, and I've been there. There was no one there, and um, I don't know how much people do go there. I don't know how much people do go to the Sheriff Center up in Felton, but that could be reduced in some way and save a lot of money. We all know we've got a debt tsunami coming with the CalPERS debt. Mr. Palacio has warned you all of that coming. I think in, in looking at this, I hope that you do include the employees. We have heard here people from the public defender's office with stories about um, being attacked. And I really would like to make sure that those employees get proper protection with some sort of a secured access, whether it's a multi, new multi-storage park, parking garage with a secured catwalk that only they can access, something like that. We need to protect those, those employees because they're probably the most vulnerable because of what they do. And uh, I just want to thank you for your service and hope that the trees around this building can be replanted. <laughs> with solar in the parking lot. Thank you. Thank you. So that concludes public comment. I'll bring it back to the board.
Motion by McPherson, second. second by Friend. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll now move on to item number 10, which is consider an ordinance repealing chapter 4.48 and section 7.100.120 of the Santa Cruz County Code and amending chapter 7.1, 8.08, 8.24, 8.30, 8.31, 8.32, 8.33, 8.34, 8.35, 8.36, 8.37, 8.38, 8.39, 8.40, 8.41, 8.42, 8.43, 8.44, 8.45, 8.46, 8.47, 8.48, 8.49, 8.50, 8.51, 8.52, 8.53, 8.54, 8.55, 8.56, 8.57, 8.58, 8.59, 8.60, 8.61, 8.62, 8.63, 8.64, 8.65, 8.66, 8.67, 8.68, 8.69, 8.70, 8.71, 8.72, 8.73, 8.74, 8.75, 8.76, 8.77, 8.78, 8.79, 8.80, 8.81, 8.82, 8.83, 8.84, 8.85, 8.86, 8.87, 8.88, 8.89, 8.90, 8.91, 8.92, 8.93, 8.94, 8.95, 8.96, 8.97, 8.98, 8.99, 8.10, 8.11, 8.12, 8.13, 8.14, 8.15, 8.16, 8.17, 8.18, 8.19, 8.20, 8.21, 8.22, 8.23, 8.24, 8.25, 8.26, 8.27, 8.28, 8.29, 8.30, 8.31, 8.32, 8.33, 8.34, 8.35, 8.36, 8.37, 8.38, 8.39, 8.40, 8.41, 8.42, 8.43, 8.44, 8.45, 8.56, 8.57, 8.58, 8.59, 8.60, 8.61, 8.62, 8.63, 8.64, 8.65, 8.66, 8.67, 8.68, 8.69, 8.70, 8.71, 8.72, 8.73, 8.74, 8.75, 8.76, 8.77, 8.78, 8.79, 8.80, 8.81, 8.82, 8.83, 8.84, 8.85, 8.86, 8.87, 8.88, 8.89, 8.90, 8.91, 8.92, 8.93, 8.94, 8.95, 8.96, 8.97, 8.98, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 8.99, 
so that uh, we will now um, adjourn our meeting until our next regularly scheduled board meeting and thank everyone for their participation and thank you to Community TV for broadcasting today's uh, meeting.